Hi everyone, Brian here wishing you a wonderful Monday and a great week ahead. As anyone knows who's been watching this series, I'm looking at the stories and primarily the figures in Holy Scripture, both in the Hebrew Old Testament and in the Christian New Testament. Uh, those scriptures that tell us, yes, the story of the people of God, and yes, what has become uh, the foundation of our theological beliefs about God and God's relationship uh, to us uh, going through the human pilgrimage here on earth. But at the same time, uh, these scriptural stories, and especially these biographies of significant people, are the stories of the mystical journey. Uh, it's our presupposition that the mystical journey is open and available to everyone, and that the voice of the soul and the reality of our deep self is there for all of us to uncover. At the same time, uh, in the way that some of us are better at sports, or some of us are better at music, uh, some of us are better at uh, academic studies, some of us are uh, better at socializing, uh, the same is true when it comes to the capacity to know the voice of the soul or the deep self fairly well. Uh, some people have a more natural ability or a stronger orientation to all of this. It's been hard to know those people in the modern era since the voice of the soul has been mm, kind of debased uh, uh, with the rise of science and technology. Though uh, we still acknowledge that we see things that are beautiful and awesome, meaningful, lovely, or horrific, uh, that we, we understand our world in this way, uh, we've given preeminence uh, to understanding the world, uh, both in the physical sphere that can be measured and manipulated in uh, laboratories, or uh, in the psychosocial world that can be studied academically as well. The soul kind of eludes a tight academic study, and as a result, we've either dismissed it or, uh, quite often, um, uh, seen it as an aberration or a psychological um, uh, oddity of the human brain. Uh, so that, for example, while we may look at a rising moon coming up over the horizon as beautiful, uh, science would tell us, yes, it's reflecting the light of the sun, but the fact that you see it as beautiful may be nice, but it's, there is no such thing as actual beauty. Uh, those of us who are soulful and spiritual believers uh, take the academic studies perfectly seriously, but we take our perceptions of the universe uh, in both their good and bad ways, uh, we take our experience of those things seriously as well. And that's the uh, realm of the soul. And we've seen uh, that many of the heroic or the major figures of scripture are among those people who have a strong orientation or a particular capacity to uh, know and understand the voice of the soul and their deep self. Over time in the West, and emerging out of the experience of the children of Abraham and Sarah, uh, there's a long lineage, and it's interesting to note that both Matthew and Luke give us that very concrete lineage uh, in the stories of Jesus, uh, that uh, coming from that sort of frail beginning, there's a long-standing tradition in Judaism to understand that the voice of the soul and the deep self can and are open and available to the voice of the divine, uh, which is quite extraordinary in as much as we've come to understand that the divine has its living reality. It's, 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 it's you can't even say existence, but it's, it's divine truth and reality uh, is not only not dependent on time and space or on energy and matter, but that uh, divinity is the author of these things, or at least the author of the dynamic universe that uh, exploded out of Big Bang, uh, but has the divine reality um, 
in a, an entirely different sphere outside of time and space and without reference to energy or matter. Uh, and while, of course, ancient people would not have used that language, uh, they were gradually over time evolving this sense of the fact that the human soul can be, and in fact is, in touch not only with uh, both the beauty and the horror, the joy and the despair, uh, the uh, incredible um, awesomeness of life, uh, in, in their experience, but that all of these things connect to something that is broader, deeper, richer uh, than the simple human experience of our own life. And, and they become sensitive to that and know that the sense of awe, joy, and gratitude they have about life, uh, as you can actually relate it to concrete things or events in our own experience here, uh, it can be related to a broader experience of soulfulness that connects us to a numinous reality outside the bounds of uh, the regular experiences of the created universe. Uh, and uh, that theory developed over time in Israel and for the Christian, of course, became culminated in the life experience of Jesus. Uh, last time we said we're going to begin to look at the story of John the Baptist. And uh, Luke, in his gospel, wants us to understand his, uh, the author of Luke, whoever that was, uh, the author of Luke wants us to understand uh, just how uh, John the Baptist is to be understood. And he does this through uh, one of the great songs or canticles of uh, the Gospel of Luke and found in other places throughout the Bible. Uh, but it's a very poetic piece that's uttered by his father Zechariah uh, very shortly after John the Baptist was born. I'm going to read it first from the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which is the authorized version that is used uh, in all of our Sunday services and other official uh, documents of the Episcopal Church. And then I'm going to read it again from uh, the translation of Eugene Peterson. Uh, again, we're reading the Peterson one, not because his is a, a more accurate um, a translation or something, but it is a more contemporary one. And uh, for our purposes here, uh, it can jog our minds out of hearing the traditional scripture in only the traditional way. For example, I grew up uh, singing in men's and boys' choirs in Anglicanism, and this is called the Song of Zechariah. And it's uh, often sung, or it was sung back in my childhood, at sung matins or morning prayer uh, in Anglican chant. And so I've known these words uh, pretty much my whole life long. And for me, they resonate, again, from the traditional uh, translations of, this, of the Bible in, in kind of this relation. It, it sort of says this is the proper way uh, to express our faith in God and God's activity uh, in the world we share with others. Uh, and I think that that's both true, but it can be limiting, and I'm hoping we'll uncover some of the things that Luke also wanted us to know. Uh, about the soulfulness, uh, the, the deep understanding of self-awareness that uh, existed both in Zechariah and also, of course, in John the Baptist. Uh, we'll see as well how it exists in uh, his mother Elizabeth. Uh, as I said in the, uh, when we were talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, we do have uh, people, even in our own age, that are very sensitive and aware and strong about understanding their soulful, deep voice. Um, but they find themselves quite often isolated and alone because they just don't have people to share it with. What's rare, and I've seen this, is when one of these very uh, good, uh, soulful listeners uh, marries another one. I mean, it can be extraordinary. It doesn't happen very often, but it does. And in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we have uh, three generations of men in this case, but three generations of men, each of whom had this uh, potent ability to know the voice of the soul. 
Uh, we have two families in the New Testament, uh, Mary and Joseph, and Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, both of whom have children, Jesus for Mary and Joseph, and John for Zechariah and Elizabeth. Uh, and all of them have high ratios of this. Uh, this doesn't happen very often. So even if we didn't claim Jesus was uh, everything that we claim of him, uh, nevertheless, he and his apparent cousin um, and their families uh, would nevertheless be of note uh, because of this, you know, high capacity for listening to the voice of the soul. So this is Luke uh, giving us a poem uttered uh, kind of in an ecstasy by Zechariah, again, just shortly after John's birth. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved for our, from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors as he remembered his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Again, those words, at least for me, uh, just roll past me and uh, in me and through me. Uh, but uh, this is... Um, how Eugene Peterson uh, translates the same section. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He came and set his people free. He set the power of salvation in the center of our lives and in the very house of David, his servant. Just as he promised long ago through the preaching of his holy prophets, deliverance from our enemies and every hateful hand, Mercy to our fathers, as he remembers to do what he said he'd do, what he swore to our father Abraham, a clean rescue from the enemy camp, so we can worship him without a care in the world, made holy before him as long as we live. And you, my child, prophet of the highest, will go ahead of the master to prepare his ways, uh, present the offer of salvation to his people, the forgiveness of their sins. Through the heartfelt mercies of our God, God's sunrise will break in upon us, shining on those in the darkness, those sitting in the shadow of death, then showing us the way, one foot at a time, down the path of peace. Once again, of course, this canticle can be the backbone of a kind of systematic thinking that uh, pervades the institutional church. Um, the idea of what is salvation, what is the forgiveness of sins, how does the life of the church, which is based on scripture and tradition, how does, how does all of that work itself out and, and what is um, Luke as an authority about how the church as an institution and as a system and as a structure, how is all of this uh, supposed to work and take place? And I have no problem with that, as I've said many times before. Uh, the problem is when we think that's the only reason it's there. It, it only tells us a little segment of the story of Jesus and a kind of theological framework for understanding how salvation actually works. Uh, both of those are valuable things, but we're watching to see in exactly the same story and in exactly the same person, the voice of the soul or the awareness Zechariah has of the deep self that is connected uh, to the divine rhythm at work in the world we share with others. 
So uh, he, I'm going to go back to the Peterson thing and read it there. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He came and set his people free. Just in those two lines, we have something that's absolutely extraordinary for contemporary human beings to experience. Uh, as of the end of the 20th century, uh, our awareness of both the physical universe as it's expanded to the very ed growing edge of the uh, universe that our uh, contemporary telescopes are bringing us new data all the time to the kind of extraordinary liveliness that occurs within a galaxy or a solar system, to the mind-blowing diversity of life that exists on our planet, and to recognize that um, uh, you know, subatomic reality became atoms, atoms became molecules, and somehow, and I, I, I'm not afraid of using this word at all, somehow miraculously, uh, molecules became living cells, and out of the most basic living cells came uh, ever and ever and ever higher forms of reality. Uh, the position of all Western uh, religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and we share this at one level or another with religious traditions uh, around the globe, including indigenous uh, spirituality here in North America, that there is a source, an origin, a great spirit, or the word that gets used in, in Western Judaism and Christianity, God, uh, there is this divine truth that is the author of all of this. Um, I remember as the uh, Soviet Union came crumbling down that the words of uh, Karl Marx that said um, uh, Christianity is an opiate uh, for the people. In other words, a way to keep the people suppressed and um, malleable to the uh, desires of the people who have power and influence in that society uh, turned out to be such a joke because it turned out that communism was the opiate of the people throughout the Soviet world. Uh, communism itself uh, as an ideal became a way to opiate or put to sleep or oppress uh, millions and millions of people for the benefit of the few that were in power. Uh, the same has been true of the story of evolution. Uh, very quickly after Charles Darwin published um, his uh, original book, The Origin of Species, by natural selection, uh, it, it, a, a huge divide almost immediately emerged, which was um, either evolution is true or God is true, and you can't have both. So, uh, and because, of course, over the decades and centuries since then, uh, evolution uh, has proven itself over and over and over again, um, we thought that would be the death of religion. Uh, the, again, the cosmic joke is not that um, evolution is like the Berlin Wall coming crashing down. It's not. Uh, but it's not killing uh, the reality of God either. Uh, God uh, is now seen as the author of evolution. The problem for a 19th century Christian was that they couldn't imagine that God would create a process of creation. Uh, Pre-Charles Darwin, every uh, religious person thought that the uh, story in Genesis was kind of literally true, that God decided on one particular day uh, to get uh, sort of planet Earth started and get all the basic necessities going, and that as days went on, uh, God just made plants and animals, etc., and then finally made human beings. And, and so if you're not going to have God as the maker in this sense, in other words, if uh, this movement from uh, subatomic reality to atoms to molecules, molecules to uh, cells, cells to multicellular uh, uh, creatures, both plant and animal, multicelled creatures becoming uh, 
more and more complex to the point where you have uh, vertebrated creatures with spinal cords and brains and then ultimately, ultimately through all of um, evolution to, uh, to the human experience uh, with a large brain and a complicated um, nervous system in a uh, otherwise rather frail body um, but that has made us a success on the crust of planet Earth. Um, now we can comprehend that this is the divine work. The divine work is evolution. Uh, not that uh, God made, made things in particular, but that God set in motion uh, a divine evolving reality uh, that has both an absolutely constructed scientific um, uh, method to it that can be easily observed, analyzed, studied, and passed on in terms of information to others who continue to add to that information. But that, that true um, bursting forth at um, Big Bang was always, from the moment it began, intertwined uh, with the loving, beautiful intention of the divine. Uh, but the, the divine wanted the universe to have free will and to move uh, uh, out from Big Bang uh, according to the kind of subatomic potentiality that is the uh, reality that uh, quantum mechanics and other subatomic theories are pointing out. Uh, so what we have in Zechariah in the first century is this awareness to bless this, to to offer one's soul back to, to be grateful and joyous toward uh, this um, kind of author of a universe that is always one step more spectacular than even the most um, articulate uh, physicist can, can name for us. And that's, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He came and set his people free. This is the huge paradox uh, that is at the heart of uh, Jewish and Christian, and I would dare say uh, Muslim spirituality, that there is a divine creative reality outside of time and space, uh, not dependent on energy or matter, uh, that inaugurated um, uh, Big Bang imbuing Big Bang with the gift of uh, divine beauty and joy uh, from the mo millisecond that uh, burst out of whatever that uh, Big Bang experience was and has renewed that at every level of uh, the evolving universe including evolution on this diverse planet and in the particular experience of us. What it says, he came and set his people free, that there is an evolution of the con human consciousness as well as a physical um, uh, evolution from subatomic to atomic to molecular to cellular to complex cellular to living beings with uh, nervous systems and brains, etc. Uh, that there is also an evolution of consciousness so this is this God of creation that set forth uh, the uh, physical evolution of the universe with uh, and imbued by the loving beauty of the divine uh, now also has an evolution of human uh, uh, self-awareness, human consciousness um, and uh, capacity uh, for the human awareness to uh, both integrate everything that we've had up until now and expand it beyond our um, current uh, corporate understanding. And you can see this in every way that we've evolved as uh, more compassionate, more caring, more grateful uh, human beings. Uh, so next Monday we will expand a little further on this and continue to look at Zechariah's song uh, which is, uh, as we said at the beginning, uh, an, one way of understanding Luke's interest in showing us just how beautiful God is. Uh, thanks for listening, and I will see you next Monday. God bless, and have a great week.